Hello, listeners of Jackie Just Chatters. This is your hostess, Jackie Lentz. This is my ongoing bonus mini-cast murder mystery serial. Each week brings a fresh letter in this cozy tale of murder. If you have not listened before, you are going to want to find letter number one and begin there. I hope you enjoy. To silence a scandalmonger, murder in an English village. Welcome to another installment of this audio drama. Play along as you step into the role of one Gwendolyn Armstrong, who is living in 1951 Oxford, England, and is in the final months of earning her bachelor's degree in history from St. Hugh's. Your post is full of regular letters from your Aunt Ivy and other occupants of the charming village of Upper Stock Green. On the surface, it seems a serene picture of stone cottages, beautiful green countrysides, and charitable neighbors. But underneath, in the darkness, A sinful world hides, and the shadow beats the heart of a murderer. By the time the last letter arrives, can you identify the killer? Previously, on A Silence, a Scandalmonger, we learned that Mr. Davies had an altercation with Ivy the day of her death. When Ivy tried to impress upon the solicitor that he should keep a better eye on the company he kept, specifically Iris, he seemed to take offense to her recommendation. In fact, he told her off. I imagine that was quite a shock to Ivy. Mrs. Owens also revealed that the Gastrels had been luring locals into an African mine speculation in the 1930s, which they knew the mine was a bust. Uncle Herbert also knew these facts. It is likely Ivy did as well. But on the whole, it seems most of the village was ignorant to the swindle. Doubtful the Gastrels wanted it coming out now, even if it was years ago. Let's join this week's adventure, shall we? A letter to Gwen from Constable Freddie Allen. 15th of June, 1951. Upper Stock Green Police Station, England. Dear Gwenny, One more week until you're home. I don't know if the days are going to fly by or drag endlessly. I am determined to give you the arrest of a murderer as your graduation gift. I know it isn't a traditional present, but you're not a traditional kind of girl, are you? In case you are in doubt, that is one of my favourite traits of yours. I bet you eat steak and kidney pie for breakfast and eggs and toast for tea. Maybe you read your textbooks while standing on your head, thus getting more oxygen to your brain, and I have a rule about only wearing green on Tuesdays. I would still think you the most spectacular girl in all of England if you did. I'm changing my suitor hat for my constable helmet now. I finally got the report back from Scotland Yard. I sent all the food and dishes in for analysis. There was digitalis in both the tea and jam. Whoever did this wanted to make sure someone was dead. The doctors at the Yard surmised your aunt would have died about 20 minutes after ingesting the poison, give or take a few minutes. It seems poisoning is not quite an exact science. I've been questioning again the list of folks you gave from Mrs. Owens. It would be easier if people would be willing to speak more frankly to me. She withholds evidence just because she can't say the word brazier in front of me. You know how silly that sounds, right? How this makes my job more difficult to do? But I am a man of my word. I will not mention it to her. For your sake. You know I would do anything for you, right? I had a man-to-man chat with the good Reverend Fernsby. That man almost broke down in tears when I confronted him about his affair. Didn't deny it, 
I guess a reverend doesn't get much chance to open up and confess his own sins instead of listening to other people's. He took this opportunity to unburden himself and ran with it. He admitted how it had been going on for months, usually their meeting at Miss Berrycloth's flat above the tea shop. Again, how was this happening in my village and I didn't have a clue? <sighs> Fernsby also confirmed that his wife had been scolded by your Aunt Ivy and threatened with exposure if it didn't stop. The morning of your aunt's murder, Fernsby met up with Miss Berrycloth at one of their usual meeting places, the Lover's Corner in the cemetery, which I am never going to look at that bit of hedgerows in the same way again. He told her it had to end. She begged him to change his mind and instead run away with her. He refused, saying that he couldn't abandon his wife, career and position, not even for love. She was thoroughly upset and left in tears. He slunk into the church to pray for their souls. How am I going to keep a straight face in church after this conversation? I had a very terse exchange with Miss Turner. She recalled being at the post office the morning in question, getting her usual newspaper. She remembered seeing your aunt inside. There was no exchange between them. I got the impression Miss Turner was avoiding Ivy and wanting to make sure there was no chance of an interaction. Obtaining her paper, she left quickly and claims to have headed directly to open the library. Your aunt was still inside the post when Miss Turner left, but she did remember passing Mr. Davies on the street on her way to work. I'm not sure her statement is of much help, but you never know. Lastly, I went to the manor house and questioned Mrs. Gastrel. I was lucky to find her husband not at home and could talk without his pompous interruptions. Agitated is the best descriptor for her. I'm not sure if it was due to guilt or a feeling that someone of her station was above police questioning. If she wasn't jumping up to ring for tea, she was pacing the floor or wringing her hands, the woman wasn't still for a moment. In between all this fluttering, there eventually was an admission to her being at Gibson's that morning. There were witnesses who could place her there, after all but under no circumstances would she admit she was buying black market goods. She claims to have returned home immediately after visiting Mr. Gibson, but there are no witnesses to support or refute this. She was even more cagey about the pot of jam she'd given your aunt, though she had to admit that she had given it to your aunt, because we already knew that. There were many assertions that the pot was fresh and unopened when she gave it to your aunt, but we can't be certain, can we? When I asked her why she was willing to part with one of her prized jars of strawberry jam, especially to someone who wasn't her closest of friends, she stammered some nonsense about Christian charity. That is a guilty woman, but that doesn't mean she's guilty of murder. I'm close, I can feel it. By next week, I will have this case solved. Plan on having that dinner and talk. I've been waiting patiently, Gwen, but a man can only wait so long. Yours still, Freddy. That's the last letter, folks. Time to put your thinking caps on. Who do you think did it, how, and why? Head over to my Facebook page, and share your theories. I look forward to seeing them. Make sure to check in next week for the reveal. This podcast was written by Jackie Lentz, narrated by Jackie Lentz, Constable Freddie Allen, voiced by Barnaby Wikes. Remember, you can follow on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, and iHeartRadio. Or you can find me, like, and subscribe on YouTube. If you are enjoying these podcasts, I would be delighted if you shared with your friends, left a rating on Spotify, 
or a review on Apple Podcast. Until next time, I wish you well. Thank you.